Welcome skeptics and truth seekers to Schoolhouse Crock, the podcast that fearlessly exposes the real deal behind public education in the state of Colorado. I am your host, Stacy Castile, and on this show, we are not here to sugarcoat. We are here to unveil the truths, challenge the norms, and unpack the crock of you know what that often goes unnoticed in the realm of education. Thank you so much for joining us. I wanted to do a portion of this episode to cover some of the basics about the podcast. This podcast will be brought to you weekly with potential for bonus features. We will be posting this on Thursday afternoons. And we do ask that you bear with us as I learn how to navigate this new venture in life. Unfortunately, because I am so late to the game with podcasting, I'm not as skilled as some of the podcasters that have been doing this for a while. I did get some feedback for some music. Definitely am working on getting some music going for the podcast, as well as we will look into doing video as we try to find more of a concrete place for these recordings to be. I've been learning about different sounds and how to make the sound better. You may notice there is kind of a louder echo sound, and again, it's just from trial and error, but we feel like the content is quality, and we want to be able to get it out and share it with you all. So please, like I said, bear with us. We are amateurs. We're just trying to figure out the best way to get some of this information out to the people of Colorado. You will be able to find us on YouTube at Schoolhouse Croc on X, also known as Twitter, at Schoolhouse Croc without a K at the end. You can find us on Facebook at Stacy4D6. Oh. And then also you can email us at Stacy S T A C E Y four, which is the number four, the letter D and the number six at gmail.com. And all of that stuff will be included in the comments section in the notes of the episode on the episode on YouTube. And after our first podcast came out, we got a lot of feedback. Thank you guys so much. I really appreciate it. Anything that you think that we could do better, any topics that you would like to hear, any special guests that you would like to hear. I know that it seems, especially from the name of the podcast, that we are against public education. And that's that's not it at all. It's more so as we're trying to empower parents, taxpayers, family members, anybody who has any type of interaction with public education. We want to educate them and help them understand what is going on. That doesn't mean that we think all public education is bad. It doesn't mean that we think that this stuff is happening everywhere. It doesn't mean that we think it's happening on every level. But what we do think is that it is important for us to discuss this stuff and have a conversation so that people can be properly educated to form their own decisions. We are not always going to agree, and that's fine. Honestly, one of the things that I think is the most concerning that we actually see in the school board meetings is that a majority of the time, everybody agrees. But is that normal? I mean, look at social media interactions. Not everybody always agrees. Sometimes people disagree just to merely disagree. That's fine. We're here to have healthy conversations, to talk about people's personal experiences, whether that applies to you or not, and how we can support each other. What resources do we have? If you are actively a public education teacher, help us. Tell us what we can do. There are often too many times that it is not blatantly lined out for a parent as to what's, what they need to do. And so if you know something, help us, tell us, but let's do it in a healthy way. Let's do it in a way that strengthens our community and not tears it apart. 
Let's do it in a way that will benefit children all the way around. We will be having more guests and one of the area of guests that we are looking into doing is reaching out to some of the candidates. As you may or may not know, this is an election year and we have State of Colorado House of Representative elections, we have Senate elections, we have congressional elections, and of course we have presidential elections. And we're going to be trying to get people on so that they can talk about their stance on public education and, and potentially talk about things that they feel like can be done better. The reason that we want to do this is because it, I'll be getting into this here in just a little bit, but is to discuss some of the bills that are coming down out of the state of Colorado because who you vote for matters and if you are voting for somebody who supports one of these bills or if you are in a jurisdiction that an elected official is sponsoring a bill or you just need to tell your elected official what you as a constituent would like to see them do this is going to be a place that we can do that because that's all important especially when it gets into the bills other guests that we will be having are parents who are in the school districts, parents who have pulled their kids from the school districts, public education teachers that are currently there, also trying to get some private schools, some charter schools. That way we can have a, a good combination of all of the different options of school right now so that parents can make educated choices. Hopefully they can listen to this and make a choice that is best for them and their family. And no matter what you do with your children, I think this is the one of the points that I really want to drive home. No matter what you do with your children, that's your choice. That's your decision. You are their parent. God put you in charge. But we want to make sure that people are able to make educated decisions for their family. Like I said previously, we are going to be discussing some of the bills that are coming down in this legislative session here in the state of Colorado. Obviously, there's probably a lot of bills that definitely need to be covered. One of the areas that we are going to try to focus the most, though, is on what affects children specifically. Obviously, in a roundabout way, everything will, will affect our children, but these ones are specifically geared towards our children right now. These bills are very concerning for what, ex what they want to do with the children. So I'm just going to jump into that. So one of the bills that we have is SB 24-001, and I will be adding a link to all these bills in the, in the notes for the episode in, on YouTube. This way you can pull it up, read what it says, make your own decisions on what you think would be the best response. If you feel led to take action, you can sign up to testify. You can contact your elected representative to give them your input. One of the things that I have heard, learned, is that a majority of our elected officials do not have the ability to read all of these bills all the way through. There's so many that come through. They're so complex. They're multi-layer. They typically are hiding stuff. They're typically worded very crazy, misleading. And so it's important for you to pay attention and be a voice and speak up for not only for the children, but to your elected official. So SB 24-001. This would extend the I Matter Mental Health Program. This program was originally set up during COVID. It was a opportunity for students when they were at home to access mental health facilitators through an online portal. And currently, the existing law, so this is already in place, what they are going to be voting on is to extend this services 
indefinitely because it is currently scheduled to be repealed on June 30th of 2024. So under the existing law, and I'm just going to read this directly from the Colorado General Assembly website, but it just says under existing law, the selection of a vendor to create or use an existing online portal to facilitate the program is exempt from the requirements of the state's procurement code. And this bill repeals the exemption. And I know that it definitely seems like a great opportunity. I think the thing that's just most concerning about it is this is basically giving children access to behavioral health services without their parents' involvement. This allows children to have mental health, behavioral health services provided to them without their parents' knowledge. If your child is suffering from something, you need to know so that you can be there to help your child. There's this concept that the parents are the problem, and I understand that there are parents that are the problem, but a majority of the time, we know that the best success for these children is to have a community around them that will help them. And oftentimes it is necessary to have the parents involved with that. If your parent doesn't know or is not aware that their child is currently seeking behavioral health services, how can they work to help that child during those times? How can they make necessary changes? What if they don't realize, you know, that their child is having such a issue with something that they're currently doing? How do we do that if the children are allowed to have these appointments without the parent's knowledge before? I often am curious how this all works as well with insurance because who's going to pay for this and what children have the knowledge and understanding of health insurance and how to bill. I, I don't understand some of those logistics of it all. So that is SB 24-001 and that will continue Youth Mental Health Services Program. Also, this bill is geared towards children that are 12 and older. There is a website that you can go to that can give you a little bit more information. It's www imattercolorado.org and it will give you more insight into what that program involves. This bill is currently being sponsored by Senator Daphna Michelson Jeanette and Representative Kyle Brown. Okay, the next bill that we are going to talk about is SB 24-049 and this one is called the content of material in libraries. Again, reading directly from the Colorado General Assembly website, the text states that concerning the content of material available in libraries and in connection with requiring notice of challenged material to be published on the internet, establishing a process for reconsideration of challenged material and preventing discrimination in a library's displays acquisition standards, public meeting spaces, and retention policies. So the way that this bill starts out, it sounds good. We learned, especially here in the Greeley-Evans area, that there is actually no protocol in place prior to 2022 for how books would be challenged. If the content of the material is not deemed to be suitable or of literary value for children. So it would establish a uh, process, it makes you sound think it sounds great. The downside that to that would be that the group that would oversee the challenges is basically put together by educational bureaucrats. So it's not necessarily people that would agree or people who think that, that this is definitely a concern. But so the, the bill goes on to read the bill establishes a process by which a student, parent, or a member of the community may object to a library resource in a school or public library. Great. Perfect. Sounds good. So far, so good. Each library resource that is reconsidered pursuant to the process must be evaluated based on standards applied by a committee for school libraries and a director of a public library. Members of the Committee for School Libraries are appointed by the superintendent of the school district and the committee covers reconsideration requests in all schools in the district. 
So here in our district, I know that our superintendent handpicked everybody that is currently on the book review committee, and not one of them is someone who is willing to listen to what any of the parents or community members were trying to say about these books. In addition to that, the superintendent is not willing to pick anybody who will tell her no or disagree with her. So when you have a superintendent hand-picking people who are her yes-men, then that is not truly giving an opportunity for community members to be heard. And I know this because I went in front of them multiple times. I went in front of the committee to object to books. I went in front of the school board to object to some of the books and they don't really care. So when the superintendent is someone who is okay with this content, and I say this and so boldly to say as well that our superintendent is okay with this content because Deirdre Pilch, the superintendent, made a big to-do back in the spring of 2022 about if anybody had the book, The Bluest Eye, in her school district here in Greeley, that they needed to pull it out. And then it turned out that one copy got was accidentally overlooked and got left behind. So then in the fall of 2022, it was determined that this book was still there. And a parent spoke out and she read a section of the book during a school board meeting. You can go on to the Greeley Evans School District YouTube page, and I believe it was in September of 2022, and look up that meeting. And they have to put a warning on the video because the content is so heavy and they decided at that point for the superintendent to pull that book out. But then by spring of 2023, the superintendent just quietly put the book back in the library. And so if the superintendent is okay with this and they're the ones that are hand picking the people, do you think that they're really going to use an objective group of people? No, they are going to use their friends. They are going to use the people that they know will support what they want them to support that aren't willing to stand up to them. And if these are the people that are picking these committees, what makes you think that these committees are actually going to take into consideration what's being said and what the concerns are? Carrying on with reading this bill, it goes on to say, a library resource may not be removed while a request for reconsideration is pending. A principal, librarian, media specialist, other employee, contractor, or volunteer may refuse a directive to remove a library resource if such an individual has a good faith belief that the directive conflicts with law or policy established pursuant to the bill and such an individual may not be subjected to retaliation. You know, this is just concerning all in all because it would be one thing if it was an, someone who was an administration, the superintendent, the principal, and I would even go on to say the librarian or media specialist, but other employee, contractor, or a volunteer. We are giving power to these people. Like, who are they? Why do they have a say? I guess I'm just confused. The bill prevents the State Board of Education from waiving the requirements of the bill as they are applied to public schools, district charter schools, and institute charter schools. So this is putting the power back in the State Board of Education. And when you have a State Board of Education that has elected officials like Rhonda Solis on it, it's concerning because, again, they're on board with it. Rhonda Solis thinks that this is perfectly acceptable. Goes on to say that the bill specifies that it is a discriminatory practice and unlawful for anyone to discriminate against anyone in the selection, retention, reconsideration, or display of library resource. This is discrimination. That's where we are at now. See, one of the things that they really tried to play on when we were saying that we were not okay with this content in the libraries was that it was all anti-LGBT. That is not the case at all. The only reason an LGBT book would be challenged would be because one, there is no literary value in the book, or if there is sexual scenes. 
So to say that challenging content in the libraries is discriminating against is absolutely insane. Discrimination is unjust or prejudice treatment. By saying that content is not appropriate, age appropriate material for children is not unjust or prejudice treatment of different categories of people. It, it, it's not. It just shows that they're worried about this because they're trying to scare people away. You know, like when they say you're racist or you're homophobic, now you're discriminating. They're just trying to tie these words that are typically adjectives you don't want to have said about you in fear that you won't say anything. Oh man, I don't think it's appropriate for my child to be reading a book about a young girl who is sexually assaulted by her father written in her father's point of view, but I'm not going to say anything because I don't want anybody to think I'm discriminating. That's insane. That's absolutely insane. SB 24-049 is being sponsored by Senator Lisa Cutter, Senator Chris Kolker, Representative Junie Joseph, and Representative Eliza Hamrick. The next bill we'll be discussing is SB 24-034, and this is increased access to school-based health care. Again, reading from the Colorado General Assembly website, the bill reads as, for purpose of the school-based health center grant program, this is going to require a grant program of some capacity. Anytime we hear about grants, because who's going to pay for this? Where's the funding coming from? We need to have our ears perk up because if we're getting federal grants or any type of grants, truthfully, there's always strings attached to it. So for purposes of the school-based health center grant program, the bill expands the definition of school-based health center and the purposes of the grant program to authorize grants for evidence-informed school-linked health care services. Services may include primary health care, behavioral health care, oral health care, and preventative health care services. School-linked health care services may be delivered through telehealth, mobile services, and referrals for health care services at a clinic near school grounds. The bill authorizes grant money to be directed to evidence-informed school-linked models to expand access to school-based health care unless the Prevention Services Division in the Department of Public Health and Environment determines that adequate proposals have not been submitted for the grant cycle. This bill also requires the Department of Health Care Policy and Financing to create a service location identifier for claims for services provided at school-based health centers or through school-linked health care services. Again, who's paying for this? Where's the, is somebody's insurance being used? How is that working? Basically, this tries to target families who are, you have a, both parents in the household are working. One parent household where the parent has to work multiple jobs. Just targeting families that do not have the ability to take their children to any type of appointments as needed. They're trying to make it sound like it's a one-stop shop. Drop your kids off. Get educated. Also, get health care services that you may need. We are the parents. God made us the parents. Why are we asking the school to do so much for us? All in the name of convenience. That's why we're doing this. But is it really convenient? You are giving up some of the right over your children. If your child is being seen for behavioral health, you may not know. If your child is being seen for preventative health, you may not know. If your child is being seen for something like a sexually transmitted disease, a pregnancy, pregnancy prevention, stuff like that, you will not know because you do not have to be involved in this process in any way. This allows the door to be opened for groups like Planned Parenthood to come in. We've heard about that throughout the state, throughout the country. It also opens up the door for potential gender-affirming care to be given to children without the parents' involvement. I think that's probably my biggest soapbox is, is it, it doesn't make sense to me why it's required to remove the parents from this conversation unless there's something nefarious going on. Because 
if you are truly doing what's right for my child, if you truly want what's best for my child and you bring me into the conversation and I can see that, you know what, this is absolutely what's best for my child, I'm probably going to be on board. But if you're going to be trying to put my child on some type of puberty blockers, I'm probably not going to be on board. So if they're doing this with the intention of not having the parents involved, you can assume that there's something nefarious going on. And I know there was a comment on Facebook about our first podcast about misinformation that is pushed out through social media. The problem is, is that one, I don't necessarily think it's misinformation. Is it happening everywhere? That might be the question. But specific misinformation, definitely not. But two, if it happened in one school district, then it's probably not completely out of the question for it to happen in another. And this shows that parents need to be involved. Parents need to have an understanding what is going on at school. Have these conversations. Get involved. Talk to your children's teachers. That is the only way to know whether this stuff is actually happening where you live or not. This bill is sponsored by Senator Janice Marchman, Senator Chris Kolker, and Representative Lorena Garcia. Just continues to increase government role within the schools in the name of health care, and it also proposes more funding for grants. The next bill we'll be discussing is HB 24-1039, and that bill is non-legal name changes looks like there's two different sections to this bill, so I'm just going to kind of skim over that for you all. In section one of the bill, it requires public schools and institute charter schools to use the student's preferred name if a preferred name is requested by the student and deems the school's refusal to use a student's preferred name a form of discrimination. Again, see, they're tying that word discrimination. They're trying to scare people. Oh, man, I just want to be inclusive. I don't want anybody to think I don't like somebody. But standing up for these children is not is not being discriminatory. And although it may seem that you are not standing up for the child, if it's the child that is requesting to have a different pronoun used or a different name used, but you're sticking up for the other children, because how do you explain that to them? Are they just supposed to take it at face value and be like, oh, okay, Johnny's now Sally. Makes perfect sense to me. Because it, it doesn't make perfect sense to anybody, honestly. Section two of the bill creates the non-legal name change in schools task force. Woohoo! More bureaucracy. Who's paying them? Who's coming up with this task? Is it Governor Polis? Because that should be concerning as well. In the Department of Education, consisting of nine members appointed by the department to examine existing school policies and provide recommendations to schools on how to best implement student non-legal name change policies. The rest of the Section 2 of this bill just goes on to some of the requirements of when the task force has to be complete, created by and, and filings and reports and all of that all of that stuff. This is very concerning. Again, non-legal name changes usually means that the parents aren't involved. So again, if I get back on that soapbox, parents are not involved. And then it's also punishing a school's refusal. We have a lot of school districts in rural Colorado that are probably not going to be on board with this. And so what is going to be the consequences for them? Also, is it really inclusive if you have big brother government standing over your shoulders saying, you will do this or else? No, it's not. This is sponsored by Representative Stephanie Vigil. Senator Faith Winter and Senator Janice Marchman. All right, and the final one that I will be discussing today is HB 24-1017. And this would create a Bill of Rights for Foster Youth. This bill establishes a statutory Bill of Rights for Children and Youth in Foster Care in Colorado, including youth participating in the Foster Youth in Transition Program, but excluding youth detained by or committed to the care and physical custody of the Division of Youth Services. 
The Office of the Child's Representative shall develop a written notice of the rights and a county department of human or social services shall provide each youth who is five years of age or older with the written notice in the youth's primary language at the time of the youth's initial placement in foster care at each placement change and at least annually. My youngest is seven and there's absolutely no way that this would even register for him at all. Like you're going to provide this. (laughs) This makes me laugh because, you know, when I was talking before about if you're in public education, like this is, tell us what we can do, help us out, help us understand. So an example would be parents of students in the public education have a bill of rights as well. And nobody reads them. And I will be the first to admit that I didn't read them either because my child needed to be tested for a learning disability back when she was in kindergarten. But because I didn't know my rights, I did not understand that all I had to do was say, test my child. Instead, it wasn't until she was in fifth grade that they finally tested her for a learning disability. And it was only because I finally was frustrated and I said, when are we going to just test her? And it was like, everybody jumped. So you mean to tell me that a five-year-old is going to read a bill of rights? That's just ludicrous. There's no two ways around it. This bill is concerning. I can speak to a different aspect of this is on the Weld Faith Partnership Council We have taken it on to try and help our foster youth in Weld County. We were talking about great programs that they have in place that would help create a, what is called a wraparound team for the the children in foster, for the families in foster as well. So it's just a way to, to help everybody out. But as we were discussing it, it started to come out that If a child says that they are LGBT or they are trans, that the foster family has to affirm that. And if you are a Christian, you have to affirm it. This bill is like 15 pages long, 14, 15 pages long. But one of the concerning parts in this bill is it says... A child or youth in foster care or participating in the foster youth in transition program created in part three of this article seven, but excluding a child of youth or youth detained by or committed to the care and physical custody of the division youth services and the department of human services has the following rights, fair and equal access, including expression of the child's or youth's gender identity and be referred to by the child or youth's preferred name and gender pronouns. You know, I think it's interesting. If a child has a preferred name, how is that documented? And we know across the country that the Department of Human Services is notorious for losing children in the system. And If we have a child going by a different name, is that going to add to that problem? Is that going to add to that problem? It's just causing more confusion. It's harder to track. How do you track that? This bill is sponsored by Lindsay Dottery, Jennifer Parenti, and Rachel Zinzinger. This is just a small list of bills that are going to be heard during this legislative session. I will definitely try to keep you all updated and posted on this. I will also, like I said, include the link for all of the verbiage for these bills as posted on the Colorado General Assembly's website. So the links will be there. You can read them yourselves if you have any type of input. I would love to hear it. One of the things that I've learned about these bills is that things can change very fast in terms of like when it's going to be heard, when you can testify, it can be pushed back. And so it's one of those things that we do kind of have to keep a closer eye on. I appreciate you guys bearing with me. Thank you guys so much for listening to me today. I hope you guys learned something from these. Have a great day.